Right. We continue in Philippians. Um, so if you get your Bibles open at Philippians 2. Um, <clears throat> where we are at the moment, we're in the section that runs uh, in actual fact from Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 all the way down to Philippians chapter 2 verse 18. And we've got another two or three weeks on these verses as yet. But it's one complete train of thought from Paul. And, uh, and just remind ourselves what he's talking about. He's, he's dealing with the whole thing of saying, look, if we're Christians, if Jesus lives in us, therefore this is what our life in the body ought to be. This is how we ought to relate to each other. And uh, fundamentally what he's doing, uh, he's hopping to and fro two things. He's, he's firstly saying, this is what Jesus is like. This is what you've got in Jesus. This is what Jesus is like. And then he's saying, well, therefore, if this is what Jesus is like, and if Jesus lives in you, which he does, if you know him, then this is consequently what you ought to be like. And so he's swapping between these two trains of thought, and he's giving a little bit, this is what Jesus is like, and then he goes on and say, therefore, you must be like this. And then he goes back, and Jesus is like this as well. Therefore, you ought to be like such and such and so and so, etc., etc. And uh, we ended up on verse 4 when he said, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Um, and of course, as I say, dealing with this whole thing, what ought our relationships with each other to be like, if indeed we're following Jesus. And uh, I very quickly touched on something that I'm going to go back to now. And what I was saying at the end of the last talk, but we didn't have enough time to go into it, into the detail that I wanted to, was to underline the fact, we've done this again and again and again here, all right, that according to the Bible, the Bible says that your relationship with the Lord is gauged according to your relationship with other people. Anyone can say, oh, my relationship with Jesus is wonderful. Anyone can say that, and it can be so much waffle. The Bible says, ah, is your relationship with Jesus wonderful? Let's see. And what it looks at isn't your relationship with Jesus, it's your relationship with each other other. And that is how we discover where we actually are with the Lord. Our relationship with Jesus is going to be reflected by each other. All right. It's not how am I doing with Jesus, it's how am I doing with other people. It's not am I really committed to Jesus, because if I am, I'll be really committed to other people. It's not do I really love Jesus, it's do I love other people. It's not, am I serving Jesus? It's, am I serving other people? And the answer to all those things, not directly how you are with Jesus, but how are you with other people? That is what the Bible says. Uh, you know, like if you think you're ill or something like that, shove a thermometer in your gob and read your temperature. And this is how we read, as it were, our spiritual uh, temperature. And this is, the Bible is the thermometer we chuck in our gob. I mean, for instance, just, just go to Matthew 6. And let's just see how, how the Bible underlines this, even in regards to forgiveness of sins. Matthew chapter 6, and it's uh, that passage which is, uh, it's just after the passage that gets rather wrongly called the Lord's Prayer. Jesus didn't have to pray this, it was what we have to pray. And uh, you get the so-called Lord's Prayer, and then in verse 14 he says, this is Jesus speaking, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now let's really get that. If we are holding unforgiveness in our hearts towards anyone no matter what they might have done, then the fact of the matter is that when you confess your sins to God, he's not listening. There is a condition on getting back into fellowship with God when we've sinned. Obviously, we've got to confess our sins, but it's no use confessing your sins and trying to get back into relationship with the Lord 
if you're holding unforgiveness in your heart against someone else. Go to 1 John. This is 1 John, the epistles of John, towards the end of the New Testament. Again, let me say, for those who uh, are still getting very used to the Bible, any verse I turn to, I will read out. So don't worry if you haven't got there in time. And uh, in 1 John, we've got this you know, the famous sort of passage, haven't we? Uh, you know, if, um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Yeah, absolutely. But let's read from verse 5. Let's read from verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him, from the Lord, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, what we're going to see is that this light and darkness is relationships with people. If we say we have fellowship with him, i.e. with Jesus, if we say I'm right with Jesus, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. Now, what is this darkness? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Can you see that? 1 John, 1. 1 John chapter 1 verse and verse 5 onwards. So we cannot say I'm in fellowship with Jesus if we're not in fellowship with other people, if there are people with whom we have sin in our hearts against that is interrupting the relationship we have. And then he says, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. So then, if we've sinned and we confess that sin, it will be forgiven and cleansed assuming we are right with other people. To be have sinful attitudes to other people, to be out of fellowship with them, uh, to hold unforgiveness in our hearts, it totally shorts out the forgiveness that we have with God. We're not talking about here that if you die, that means you'll go to Lake of Fire. If you're born again, you know, you will go to heaven. Salvation can't be lost. But it means you can't get back into fellowship with God until you're back in fellowship with whoever that person is that you're out of fellowship with at the moment because you've got a sinful attitude to them or something like that. And then he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. My personal relationship with Jesus depends at all points with my personal relationship with other people. Just go uh, to chapter 3, still in 1 John, but chapter 3, verse 16. And he says, By this we know love, that he, i.e. Jesus, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. Anyone can love in word and speech. Oh, bless you, brother. No. It's what we do. It's not what we say. It's the way we are. It's the way we are. And if the love of Jesus is abiding in our hearts, i.e., if I'm really in fellowship with Jesus, then that love is going to come out onto other people. And if that love isn't coming out onto other people, there's only one conclusion. I'm not, therefore, in fellowship with Jesus. Someone, something, somewhere is preventing that flow of his love through me. Uh, go back into chapter 2. Sorry, go forward into chapter 4. And verse 20. And he says, If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. Just note, the Bible is not frightened to put issues as black and white as that. Uh, you'll find the accusation of liar very frequent in the Bible. All right, Because God knows our hearts. I mean, sometimes lying is just what we're up to, gross hypocrisy. You can come along to meetings, oh, Lord, I love you, we love you, Lord, we lift our voice, blah, blah, blah. And yet, is there resentment? Is there unforgiveness? If there is, then God says, you're a liar. It's tough, isn't it? For who you cannot love God, sorry, um, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God 
whom he has not seen. And there you have it. It's no use saying, I love God, because God cannot be seen, so there's no way to verify whether you love God or not. But we verify whether we love God by whether or not we love other people. So if you want to know, all right, if you're serving God, are you serving others? If you want to know if you love the Lord, are you loving others? If you want to know if God's hearing you when you pray, have you forgiven everyone? And I mean no matter what they've done, they might have been terribly cruel to you. People might have done desperately wicked things against you. But don't forget the desperately wicked things you've done against other people. And I know the desperately wicked things I've done against other people. You know, we've got to be dead real with God about this. We must forgive people from the heart and make sure we have no resentments towards people and that we really are putting them first. And that way we can really know that our relationship with Jesus is more than just humbug. But if relationships with others aren't right, then to talk about our relationship with Jesus is just so much humbug. Now, having said that, let's get back into Philippians, where we're going to see Paul continuing this, this very <laughs> argument. He keeps bashing it home, bashing it home, as I say, swapping between, you know, what Jesus is like, and therefore, if Jesus lives in us, what we ought to be like, okay? So let's, let's, let's just start with verse 5, okay? Um, verse, I think we'll read from verse 5 down to 11, all right? Um, and Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's just start there with verse 5. He says, Have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus. Remember, he's impressing upon them the way they ought to be, the type of people they ought to be, given that Jesus is living in them. And what he says here is he says, have the mind that he's in Christ Jesus. Now then, just understand this. This is incredible. If Jesus lives in us, that means that his mind is in us as well. Uh, you can't separate a person from their mind, can you? So if Jesus lives in us, so does his mind. We literally have the mind of Jesus. Go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse 16, Paul says, For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Rhetorical question. But he says, but we have the mind of of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, which gives us a choice. We can think like us, or we can think like him. And we're back to this choice, aren't we? In every situation, are we going to think like us, or are we going to think like him? If we think like us, it's going to be sinful. If we think like him, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be holy. It's going to be pure. And Paul says, look, Jesus' mind is in you. Or uh, think of it like this, we can let Jesus think through us. That's the point. We can let Jesus think through us. So where are we going to set our thoughts? On what we want or on what Jesus wants? And in verse 6, what is this mind? You know, because again he's saying, you know, have the same mind that Jesus has, i.e. be like Jesus. And he goes on, say, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, we'll, we'll take that, that, you know, first of all. He said, firstly, and he's, what he's doing here is he's going to describe what Jesus' attitude is, all right? And he's going to demonstrate his way of thinking, his outlook, and he's going to say, and you must have the same way of thinking, and outlook. So what is the way that Jesus thinks? Well, firstly, Paul says he was in the form of God. 
Now, this phrase, form of God, morphe deo, okay, now, morphe is the word for in the form of God. And what it means is the actual nature and essence of something, all right? So if you get this Greek word morphe in the form of, it means the actual nature and essence of the thing being described. It means literally the same thing, all right? Uh, in verse 7, it says that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Now, that's the same <laughs> word, form, morphe, form of a servant. Now, here's the point. Jesus was literally, in every possible sense of the word, a servant. I mean, his life was one of service. So, Jesus was literally a servant. The Bible says that he took the form of a servant. What does that mean? That he was literally, in every possible sense of that word, a servant. And here, in verse 6, the Bible says that Jesus was in the form of God. <coughs> so what does that tell us? It means that Jesus was literally, quite literally, and in every possible sense of that word, Jesus was God himself. Jesus is God. Let's just go into John's Gospel. I know you don't need me to labour this point, but it actually does need labouring for reasons you'll see in just a moment. If you go to, to John's Gospel, and, and chapter 1, um, he's just going to read first of all verse 1, and then going to belt down into verse 14. And uh, we've got, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, let me just say something about this word, Word. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, John here is talking about, in the beginning was the Word. Now, now, the Greek word here, translated word, this gets complicated. The Greek word here, translated word, is logos. And it's actually uh, a philosophical term that the Greeks were very aware of. Because in Greek philosophy, okay, they had the concept of the logos, the word, and what it meant was the mind and the reason behind all things, if you like, the mind and the reason of God. And uh, it was very, very helpful for John to use that terminology because a lot of the, uh, the people that they were evangelizing and telling about Jesus were Greeks um, or they were non-Greeks but who had been brought up with Greek culture. And so it would have instantly meant something to them. And in fact, you get in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 18, I think, when Paul hits Greece, uh, he finds this uh, kind of uh, a building erected to the unknown God, and, and the Greeks believed in an unknown God, that God was, couldn't be known, right? And Paul said, the God who you don't know, I do know, and his name's Jesus. And that's what John's doing. He's saying, look, this unknowable God, all right, that's the one I'm talking about. He's definitely there, but you lot think you can't know him. Well, I'm telling you, you can. And so he says, in the beginning, and uh, it's sort of like already was, is the literal. Not, not in the beginning was, but in the literal Greek, right, it's in the imperfect tense here, in the beginning already was the Word, and the Word already was with God, and the Word already was God, all right? So he's saying, you know, the reason, you know, in the beginning there was God with his mind and his reason, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you go down to verse 14, he says, and the Word, the Logos, all right, the Word became flesh, it's in the aorist tense, once and for all, uh, an action that happened once and will continue throughout all time, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. So here, John starts his gospel by saying that God became a man called Jesus. He was God. He was everything God is, totally 100% God. But God became a man. All right. Now, the reason, because, I mean, it's like, obviously, I say Jesus is God. I mean, I'm telling you something you all know. I mean, no one here is going to argue against it. But you, you do need to be aware of this because, you see, you'll find, whether it's in the Christian church, I mean, certainly Islam, but even in the Christian church today, you'll find lots and lots of people, and they argue like this. They say Jesus never actually claimed to be God. 
Have you heard this on TV programmes and stuff like that? The theologians. They say, yeah, but it's a big misunderstanding. Jesus never claimed to be God. I mean, the JWs, they argue this as well, don't they? But so some so-called Christians, uh, you know, in so-called Christian churches argue the same thing. They say, Jesus never actually claimed to be God. It's a misunderstanding. He said he was the Son of God. He never actually claimed to be God. Now, let me just show you very quickly, you know, from the scriptures that that is rubbish. That is rubbish. Anyone who maintains that Jesus never claimed to be God quite simply does not know what they're talking about. They've neither researched their history nor their culture. Just go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Verse 31. Jesus has just, you know, done one of his little speeches. And in John 10, 31, we read this. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. So they're about to kill him. Jesus answered them because stoning was the death penalty, all right? And they were about to do that. They shouldn't have done. The Romans had taken away the Jewish right of capital punishment, which they most of the time honoured. But Jesus was enough. He got up their noses enough to make them think, oh, you know... I'm not worried about the Romans, he's so annoying us, let's sort of kill him now. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? The Jews answered him, we stone you for no good work, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now then, let me ask you, the Jews to whom Jesus was talking, did they believe he was claiming to be God or not? They knew full well that Jesus was claiming to be God because the terminology that Jesus was using when he talked about being the Son of God and the Son of Man, that terminology, especially at the time at which Jesus came to Israel, was terminology that was set aside exclusively for Messiah. So Jesus came along doing his teaching and the Jews and the Pharisees who heard the teaching, they said, he's claiming to be God, let's stone him. Because obviously if someone claims to be God and they're not, it's blasphemy and according to the Jewish law, stoning. Now of course it wasn't blasphemy because Jesus was God. But question, did Jesus claim to be God or not? Well obviously everyone at the time that the Bible was written, everyone who heard him, knew full well that he was claiming to be God. They were under no illusions at all. And even the people who hated him, one of the reasons they did hate him was because he kept claiming to be God. Go back into chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 48. And believe me, this bit, if this isn't someone claiming to be God, nothing, nothing is. John chapter 8, verse 48. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? I mean, this is sort of like below the belt stuff. People argue this when they've lost the argument, <laughs> all right? <laughs> when they've lost the argument, they get personal, all right? And uh, so they were trying to put Jesus, one, down to being a Samaritan, i.e. not a true Jew at all. And uh, secondly, that he had a demon and that. Now, Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honour my Father and you dishonour me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he will be the judge. Truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died, and the prophets who died? Who do you claim to be? So here's Jesus saying, look, if you believe in me, you'll never die. And they said, what are you talking about? Abraham died. Are you claiming to be greater than Abraham? The prophets died. You know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, you claiming to be, who are you? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say that he is your God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I said I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. 
mincing your words, you know, or rather not mincing your words. But I do know him, and I do keep it. You know, Jesus saying, you're the liars, not me, sunshine. I don't know whether that's loving preaching, but nowadays most Christians say it isn't. <coughs> it's call your hearers liars. Oh. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now, here's Jesus talking about Abraham. He says, Abraham was glad to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. The Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple. Now, Jesus said, they said, you know Abraham? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, keep fingering there, but go back into Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And actually see what Jesus said to them here. Exodus chapter 3. And this is the encounter that Moses had at the burning bush. You know, when God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. And uh, Exodus 3, we're just interested in verse 13 and 14. So, so, you know, so I mean, you know, Moses is rapping with the Lord here in the bush, all right? Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? So here, God is revealing himself to Moses, and he says, Moses, go and save my people. And Moses says, What if they don't believe me? Who... Who shall I say sent me? What's your name? <laughs> All right, what he says. God said to Moses, I am who I am. It's one of God's names. And he said, and this God says, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. Who was talking to Moses through the burning bush? It was Jesus. And here... Jesus, they said, what? You know Abraham? And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him. It is the most blatant way that Jesus could have used of claiming before the Jews that he was God. He was literally saying to them, I called, I called Moses, I called Abraham, it was me, I am your Lord God. And the reason they stoned, well, the reason they wanted to stone him, because he was claiming to be God. Simple as that. Um, go to John, John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 17. Jesus answered them, My father is working still and I am working. You see, God, Jesus kept calling God his father. Now this was why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his Father, making himself equal with God. Now then, you'll find even genuine Christians, all right, some Bible teachers, in regards to Jesus claiming to be the Son of God and the Son of... They were the titles he liked most. Jesus the Son of God or the Son of Man. They were the titles that Jesus mostly used of himself. And you'll hear sort of like Bible teachers saying that the title the Son of God emphasised the fact that he was divine. And his title the Son of Man emphasised the fact that he was human. You see, God became a man. So Son of God was his God side, if you like, and Son of Man was the man side. Now again, that is absolutely not true. I mean, this phrase, the Son of God, in Jewish culture, the son was the father. When your first son came of age, he had exactly the same authority as his father. So when Jesus was calling himself the son of God, the Jews said, what, you're, you're, you're making yourself equal with God. It was a way of Jesus claiming to be God. So the Bible teachers get that right. But son of man, son of man, is that referring to the fact that Jesus was a man? He was God, become a man. Well, no, it absolutely isn't. Just go back into Daniel. What does this phrase, the son of man, mean? What did it mean to the people that Jesus was speaking to when he kept using it? We haven't seen the references where he calls himself the son of man, but believe me, there are lots and lots of them, but we won't turn to them. But in Daniel 7 and verse 13, all right. Now, this is one of the, vi you know, the visions that Daniel is having. He's sort of like taken up into heaven. He's having a vision of, of things that are going on in heaven. And uh, in chapter 7 and verse 
13, he says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, i.e. the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, kingdom, that all peoples and nations should serve him. His domain is an everlasting one, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Now what's happening here? One like a Son of Man is presented to the Ancient of Days and is given all power. Who's the Ancient of Days? It's the Father. Who's the Son of Man? It's Jesus being given all authority. The Son of Man meant God. So at all points in Jesus' preaching, he was definitely, without any shadow of a doubt at all, saying, I am God. Let's really top that one off and go to John 20. And just really, you know, so that it is absolutely clear and no one can doubt it. This really gets up the JW's noses, this one. John 20 and verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Um, you know, you get all this stuff about that Jesus had a body that could pass through walls. He didn't have a body that could pass through walls. I mean, that suggests that he was a spectre or something. It's not that he passed through walls. You know, it's, um, it's just that, you know, Father has been watching Star Trek and he's managed to uh, perfect one of their, uh, you know, beam me up Scotties, you see. That's, that's how he did it. He said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless but believing. Now look at this. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Now this is Thomas, this is a Jew. This is a Jew. If a Greek said my Lord and my God, he could be referring to any one of the hundred secondary deities he believed in. But this is a Jew. Thomas is an Orthodox Jew. An Old Testament believing Jew who believed there was but one God. And Thomas says to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now, here, Thomas proclaims Jesus as God. What does Jesus do? Does he accept this worship or does he reject it? He not only accepts it, he commends Thomas for it. Jesus accepted worship from Thomas as the Lord God of Israel. Now then, that makes Jesus one of two things. God himself or a devil. Do you see? Which one was he? Clearly, he was God himself. So, in Philippians, when Paul says that, that, that Jesus was in the form of God, the morphe of God, what he was saying is that Jesus was literally, in every possible sense of the word, he was God. And here we hit up against the Trinity, the fact that God exists in three persons. Now, don't ask me to explain that. I can't explain to you how my television set works either, but that's not going to stop you using one, is it? I can't explain the Trinity, no man can. We just accept it as a fact. The Bible says God knows everything there is to know. I can't explain that. I don't know how omniscience works, but I believe it, I accept it. And the Bible tells us that God exists in three persons. Always has done, always will do. The nature of God is that there are three of him. Oh, how weird. But that's the truth. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see here, this aspect of Jesus' character that Paul is trying to bring out here, is that Paul is going to show them that in, in order to win salvation, the second person of the Trinity, all right, actually changes his mode of existence. God can do that, you know. The second person of the Trinity, we're going to see, changes his mode of existence and becomes a man in order, in order to win salvation. Now, we're going to come back to that point in one moment, all right? But the main point of verse 6 
is the second part. We've seen who, though he was in the form of God, we got here, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now you get various weird and wonderful translations of that verse, which is admittedly difficult to um, translate from the actual Greek. But the main word here is the Greek word that in my Bible is, um, is translated grasped. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now that word grasped is harpagmus, and it comes from the Greek word harpadso, which means to seize or to carry off by force. You know, you know the old rape and pillage thing. That that you know, when you go in and you seize something and you carry it off by force, you grasp it and you don't let it go. It's mine, and I'm not going to let it go. All right. Now that is the meaning of this word here. And that what we have is the attitude, the attitude that the second person of the Trinity had towards himself and his position and essential being as God. What we're going to see here, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, was God. But what was his attitude to it? That is what Paul is trying to bring out. We're going to see now the attitude that Jesus had to his position in heaven as God himself. And his attitude was quite simply this. When the need arose because of sin and us whom he created, when the need arose, the second person of the Trinity freely gave it all up for something far less in order to help us. His attitude was, as soon as the need arose, because he loved us, he gave it all up and accepted something far less in order to help us. And what we have here is the supreme example of humility and self-renunciation. And that is exactly what Paul is encouraging the Philippians to grow in. Stop thinking about yourself, me, 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 <coughs> mine, mine, mine. Look to the needs of others. And Paul is showing them just what Jesus did, that he is like that. Rather than holding on to and grasping, this is what Paul's saying, Jesus, rather than holding on to and grasping what was his by absolute right, by virtue that he was God, rather than grasping onto it and holding on to it, he let it go in order to help other people. And in verse 7, what Paul says is that he emptied himself. He's saying that because of the need that arose, sin, all right? And because Jesus loved us. Because of the need that arose, Jesus didn't think, well, I'm quite comfortable up here. I'm God. I've got all power. Nothing can hurt me. I'm absolutely unassailable. Nothing can go... Jesus didn't hold on to all that. He didn't grasp it. He said, I must help. And if that means giving up what I've got now, I'm going to give it up because I love them. Because I love them. I'm going to give up what I've got now. I'm going to let it go so I can help them. And in so doing, he emptied himself. So Paul is saying, the second person of the Trinity, his attitude was this. He didn't hang on to what was his by right. He was willing, because of his love for others, to give it up and to empty himself. Now, what does it mean that Jesus emptied himself? What did he empty himself of. Now, there's just a little heresy we're going to bash on the head here. What did Jesus empty himself of? Remember, what is happening is that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is changing his natural form and his natural mode of existence, and via the virgin birth, he's becoming a man. The second person of the Trinity was not a man, he was God. Jesus was not a man. But he became a man. All right? That is what's happening. He changed his mode of existence and he became a man via the virgin birth. Now just bear in mind, was that a step up for him or was it a step down? Was that kind of a promotion or was it a sacrifice? Just bear that in mind. Now in regards to this verse that he emptied himself, 
Some teach that he emptied himself of his godhood. They say that what this verse means, he gave it all up and he emptied himself of his godhood. So he wasn't actually God anymore. But what that would mean is that once he was born as a baby, throughout his earthly time, that would mean that Jesus wasn't actually God anymore. Now, that is not only a heresy, it's also nonsense. It's nonsense. It's not, a, you know, God cannot, even God, logically, cannot stop being God. Can you see? I mean, even God is bound by logic. There, there are some things that God cannot do. Uh, for instance, God can't make a square with three sides. Are you getting the point? It's a nonsense. We're, we're tied up with words here. A nonsense. That's why when you get all the, uh, you know, sort of like the people who think they're really clever, you know, say, well, who made God then, eh? <laughs> get out of that one. Yeah? <laughs> now, I mean, the point is, the word God means the uncreated one. Can you see? There's no answer to it because it's a meaningless question. Who made God? It's a meaningless question. Where did God come from? A meaningless, you know, you might as well go like that. It doesn't mean a thing. Now, and in the same way, it's no use saying, well, go on, God, make a square with three sides if you're so powerful. Make a square with three sides. Like, it's, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Or for instance, say, go, go on, God, here's, here's a penny. Make that so hard you can't lift it. I mean, it can't logically be done. Now, in the same way, if people try and maintain that when Jesus emptied himself, that he emptied himself of his godhood, that is a semantic nonsense. He either is or he isn't. You can't be God and then stop being God for 33 years and then go back to heaven and take up being God again. You know, I, I mean, so it's, it, it's not talking about the fact that Jesus emptied himself of his godhood, all right? And that... <clears throat> What Paul is meaning here, and the clue, the giveaways in verse 17, as I'll show you in one moment, all right, the point isn't so much that Paul is saying that Jesus emptied himself of anything. The point that Paul is making is that Jesus emptied himself. Just go down into verse 17, verse 17, and you'll see, you'll connect what Paul says here with what he's saying in verse 6, all right. In verse 7, remember, Paul's in jail and he knows that sooner or later he's going to be killed, all right? Now then, he says, even if I am to be poured out as a libation upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. Now, what was a libation? A libation was a drink offering. And what you did, you got precious water or something in the middle of the desert, and to show your love for God, you poured it out. You poured it out, a sacrifice of drink. And Paul says, even if I'm to be poured out as a libation, <coughs> i.e., Paul's saying, it's very possible that now I'm going to lose everything because I'm going to get my head chopped off. All right. So the point is that what Paul is saying is that what Jesus was doing, it wasn't that he emptied himself of anything, but if you get a cup of water and pour it out, you're emptying the cup. Here's it. It's going down. And that's the point. Jesus, because of his love, he was willing to empty himself. He was willing to leave heaven. He was willing to leave behind that natural mode of existence as being God, you know, in a complete form. He gave that up in order to become a man. He was still God, but he changed his mode of existence, but to a very inferior one, and thereby he emptied himself. He poured himself out for us. Now, there is one thing here that must be understood properly. Now, if I say to you, whatever God does, he does properly. Everyone will, you know, obviously. Whatever God does, he does properly. And, uh, I mean, that, that ought to apply for us. If something ain't worth doing properly, it's not worth doing. And that's why Paul says, look, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever God does, he puts him whole self into it, all right? All three of him, <laughs> right? So whatever we do, we've got to put our whole self into it, all one of us, you know, because, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, if there were, you know, I'm not schizophrenic, I praise the Lord, I'm not either. And, um, <laughs> but obviously, whatever God does, he does in a totally proper way. He does it properly. So, therefore, if God becomes a man, and what Paul is dealing with here isn't if, you know, he's talking about the fact through the virgin birth, Jesus became a man, all right? So, if God becomes a man, therefore, because whatever God does, he does properly, therefore, when God becomes a man, he becomes an ordinary, literal, real one. Now, you see the point. 
If God becomes a man, he's got to become an actual real man. Uh, there was a heresy that the early church faced, and it was that Jesus wasn't actually human. He was still in his natural form as God, but he just appeared like a man. He wasn't really a man. He wasn't really there, you know, so you couldn't... He could make it, because he was God, he could, he could make it like you felt you touched him, but it was like a spectral body. No, no, Jesus became a literal flesh and blood human being. Now, here's the point, with all the limitations of every ordinary flesh and blood human being, Jesus didn't have any divine power lurking somewhere inside of him that he could depend on. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? How could we identify with Jesus if Jesus was walking around bulging with his own miracle working power? He could have been. It was his by right. But men aren't bulging with miracle working power of their own, are they? So neither was Jesus. Now here's the point. Jesus was an ordinary man and he differed from us in one respect only. He didn't have a sinful nature. That was the only respect in which he differed from us. He didn't have a sinful nature. You get your sinful nature from your human father. Uh, Jesus didn't have a human father. Virgin birth. All right. Uh, so he didn't have a sinful nature. But in every other way, he was exactly like us. Now, what this means is this. Jesus did not operate or live from his own supernatural powers as God. He could have done if he wanted to. Jesus can do anything. He's God. But he, he decided not to. Part of the package of becoming an ordinary human being was that he'd have to leave all that behind. Gives you the point. So therefore, Jesus didn't operate from his own supernatural powers, all right? He left them all behind. He could have brought them, but he didn't because he wanted to do it properly. Jesus operated through the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, having been glorified, he's got all his power back now. But while he was on earth as a man, in a limited way, all right, not glorified, he operated only through the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just go to John chapter 5. A lot in John's Gospel tonight, but... Um, John chapter 5. And let's, let, let's see this. It, it is tremendously important. John chapter 5, and first of all, verse 19, uh, when Jesus says, Truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. Go down to verse 30, same chapter. I can do nothing on my own authority. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Turn over into chapter 7. And verse 16. Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Go over into chapter 12. Verse 49, For I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment what to say and what to speak. Just chapter 14 now. Chapter 14 and verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Now, can you see the point? Jesus lived the life he did, not because he was drawing on his own innate power as God. He'd have had too much of an unfair advantage. He couldn't have identified with us. Jesus freely decided not to draw on that. So how did Jesus live the life he did? He lived the life he did by letting the Father live through him. As you see the point. Jesus lived the life he lived because he allowed the Father to live through him totally. And when Jesus healed the sick, it was because he drew on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
when Jesus uh, knew things that there was no way for him to know. It was a word of knowledge. It wasn't because Jesus was omniscient. He could have been, but he laid that aside. He laid that aside temporarily. Jesus lived through the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. He let the Father live through him. Now here's the point. Paul's entire argument in Philippians is this. Let Jesus live through you. As we progress through these verses in the next two or three studies, that will come out in a far more blatant way. Just go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 21, and this is when Jesus is uh, appearing to them, having been raised again from the dead. And in John 20, verse 21, and Jesus says this, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Jesus said, right, I lived the life I did because I let God the Father do it through me. And he's saying, right, now I'm going to be living in you, my disciples, so you live the same type of life, but let it be me living it through you. Can you see the point? We walk in exactly the same path that Jesus trod. He did it, we can do it. That is the argument of the Bible. Jesus depended purely on the Father, so let us depend on Jesus. This is what we're growing. This is the point. Jesus lived the life he did because he let the Father live through him. And the Bible says to us, right, Jesus is in us. Let Jesus live through us. All right. So that covers the, 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 you know, the, the, the whole thing about Jesus and that passage there. What we have, Jesus is truly human. He's truly divine. God became a man. And what it boils down to is this. God shared what we have. God shared what we are human in order that we could share in what he is. Let's go to 2 Peter. The second letter of Peter and in chapter 1 and verse 4 and Peter says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion, and it's talking there about evil feelings, and become partakers of the divine nature. God took on human nature, and he says, right, now you can take on my divine nature. And that is what Paul is arguing here. He says, right, this is what Jesus did, all right? Uh, he kind of, he said, right, there's a need. I'm not going to sit pretty up here. I love these people. I'm going to become a man. And in so doing that, he took such a downward step. It, 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 it's half, you know, impossible to believe the, the amount that he humbled himself in order to do it. And then in verse 7, all right, after he says, but emptied himself. Now, just look at this downward journey that Jesus is taking, all right? Uh, I mean, God becoming a man is a downward enough journey, isn't it? But look at this. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, down, 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 and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Down, down, down. Even the death on the cross. The death of a criminal, the most shameful death that the ancient world had to offer. Can you see, Paul is saying that Jesus went down, 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 down. This is humility and obedience. And that's why Paul is arguing. He says, look, this is the attitude that God has. This is the type of God he is. If he's alive in us, our attitude ought to be the same. The humility and obedience of Jesus. And what it means is this, that no one can go so low that God has not gone lower. Now, what an incredible thought. No one can go so low that Jesus hasn't gone lower. So, God becomes a man, servant, death, and a shameful and a terrible death. Down, down, down. And then in verses 9 to 11, therefore God hath highly exalted him. You get the upward journey. 
the resulting upward journey, because in God's plan, downs are always followed by ups. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, that's straightforward, God's home, on earth, that's straightforward, our home, uh, under the earth. Why under the earth? Why it's the place of the dead? The place of the dead is literally in the centre of the earth. But of course, if you're one of these people who doesn't believe the Bible literally, you've got to chuck that verse away as a bit of a nonsense. Well, under the earth, what does that mean? It means what it says, all right? Uh, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the point is this. Everything Jesus gave up on this downward journey in becoming a man, everything he gave up, it was restored to him when he was glorified. Jesus now, although he's still in human form, he has all his power back. Jesus is not now living through the power of the Father. He's living through his own power now. He's got that all back, all right? But everything that Jesus gave up was restored to him when he was glorified, you see. But the point is this, and also the Father had his new family. Believers. That's what it was all about. God wanted a family. But in order to get his family, there had to be salvation. In order for there to be salvation, there had to be someone who was God and man, who could mediate between God and men. So Jesus, because of his love, his humility, he was willing to be that person, and therefore we are saved. Now, what I want us to do now is to step back, and these verses, this emptied himself and, you know, humbled himself and down and death on a cross and blah, blah, blah. We've seen it in a bit of detail, but now what we've got to do, if we're to really get the full meaning of the picture that Paul is painting here, we've got to step back and see it in the full panorama, all right? So step back. Stop looking at the details, but step back and let the whole thing come into vision and you'll really get the whole idea of what Paul is saying here. And it's simply this, all right. I'm going to call it the low-level approach. Paul is simply describing that Jesus decided to take what we're going to call the low-level approach. Now, let me explain. Uh, some years ago, I met a bloke who was an ex-RAF wing commander, and uh, he was one of their aces. And I don't know if he still does, but certainly at the point when I got to know him, although I never knew him well, he, had, he held the world record for jet ascent. This is something that flying aces in the Air Force get up to. They like their world records and stuff like that. And he had the world record for jet ascent, which is basically this. He made a jet go up faster than anyone else. He got faster and further up in a less space of time than anyone else. And he had the world record for jet ascent. Now you might think, well surely a jet just goes up as fast as it can go. How can you have varying speeds? And it's for this reason. You can get a jet, if you just take off and then poof, off you go, using full thrust, there's not a lot of variation in how fast the jet goes. It will just go as, as powerful as it is. But if you descend in free fall from a terrifically great height, i.e. just below the, you know, just, just where the atmosphere starts, if you're the kind of idiot <laughs> who will let your jet go into free fall, thousands and thousands of feet, then the nearer you are to the ground when you swoop, all right, you've got all that thrust behind you. And the lower you get before you pull the nose up and then give it all the welly you've got from the rockets, or whatever it is, from the jets, all right, <coughs> the faster up you will go. So if you just take off in a jet and up you go, you'll get quite a high speed. But if you drop virtually from outer space first and then swoop, you know, just a few hundred feet above, you know, ground level, with all that momentum and thrust and then hit the jets, you can get a jet to ascend far faster than it can under just its own power. Now this guy held the record. Now, and it depended how low you would dare allow yourself to go before you pulled the jet up, and this guy had the world record, all right? So the point is, you know, the higher up you are when you start your free fall, all right, the further down you've come, the faster you'll go up. Have you got the picture there? That is what I'm calling the low-level approach, and of course, if you get it wrong, you're very dead, aren't you? Because when a jet <laughs> ploughs into the ground in free fall from about eight or nine miles up, you're in big trouble, aren't you? But, I mean, this guy, he was a nutter anyway, so, I mean, he didn't mind, okay? Now then, the point is, the lower, the, the lower you dare go, the faster and further you'll ascend after 
your descent. Now here's the picture. Jesus swoops down from as high as you can get. He was God himself in heaven. You can't get much higher than that. I'm not now talking in actual, uh, you know, up and down in that heaven is outside of the universe, all right? But the point is, Jesus swooped down, all right, from as high as you can get. He was God himself in heaven. And he swooped down to as low as you can get, which is a man dying on a cross and going into paradise in the centre of the earth because of sin. That's about as low as you can get. But having come from so high and then swooped down so low, he then goes back up as high as you can possibly get. Can you see? But the difference is this. When he gets back, he's taken with him those who were as low as you could possibly get. I.e. Jesus has started the ascent empty-handed. Just him. But by the time he's finished it, He's got millions and millions and millions of other people and an open door for as many other millions as there could possibly be. All they have to do is believe on Jesus. And here's the point. Jesus came down to our level to take us back up to his level. That is the whole point here. Just go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul actually talks about this in Ephesians. Though it's probably in a group of verses that you've never known what on earth they mean. Well, now you will. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 8 to 10. And he says, Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Because that's where all the believers who had died were, in the centre of the earth, all right? And he who descended is also he who ascended far above all the heavens. This is what Paul's talking about. Jesus came down from as high up as you can get to as low as you can get, and he took up back with him those who were as low as you can get. Can you see it, this incredible swoop? And the uh, picture that Paul is using here, when he ascended he led a host of captives, the ancient world knew exactly what he meant. Uh, when the Romans went up to bash someone up, I mean, they thought, right, let's go and invade this country. When the Romans had a fight, what they did is that when they beat whatever army they were beating, all right, or fighting against, when they beat them, they brought all the soldiers and that back as slaves to Rome. They enslaved their cap you know, they enslaved the people they'd beaten. And when the army got back, there was this incredible procession, all right, as the Romans marched back into Rome, bringing with them all the people that they'd taken captive, all the treasure, all the spoil. And it was called leading captivity captive. That was kind of the phrase that was used in the ancient world. And the point is that when Jesus returned to heaven, who were the captives he had with him? Everyone who either had or was going to believe on his name. We are the spoils that Jesus fought for. We are the prize, we are the treasure that he was after. Any human being who, once he'd made a way of salvation, would accept that way and give their lives to him. So Jesus left heaven empty-handed and he went back there with people. Sinners who have been saved as a result of what he'd done. Swooped down and grabbed up and back to heaven. Now then, I'm not sure if this is ringing any bells, but something very similar is going to happen at some point we know not what. And it's called the rapture. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Everyone's sitting there, I knew he'd get the rapture in here somewhere. He always does. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Talking about the rapture. For those who know about the rapture, it's all on the salvation series tapes in great detail. All right, but here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, For the Lord himself, Jesus will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Caught up together with them in the crowds. That Greek word, caught up, caught up, is harpazo. Now, do you remember we saw that when we said that Jesus didn't grasp what he had, that was exactly the same word. 
And what happens at the rapture is Jesus reaches down and he grabs up, he seizes all his people and takes them back to heaven. So what Paul is saying in verse 6, Paul said Jesus didn't grab what he had. Oh no, because he loved us, he let all that go. He didn't hang on to what he had, he let that all go and sacrificed himself. But he did it in order that he could grasp onto us. Do you see the point? Jesus gave up what he had. He wouldn't hold on to that. Why? Because he wanted to hold on to us. But the only way he could hold on to us was if he let all that that he had in heaven go. Now can you see what I'm saying? Paul is bringing out the attitude of Jesus. This is what our God is like. And the attitude of Jesus was quite simply this. Picture him sitting in heaven and he thinks, right, I can hang on to what I've got here or I can go down and I can hang on to them. Hmm, I wonder what I'll do, he said. But there was never an argument. It was him or it was us. Who did he choose? He chose us. Jesus put himself last. In the light of this, who does Jesus love most? Does he love you most or does he love himself most? He loves you most. Does Jesus love me most or does he love himself most? He loves me most. Can you see? And what Paul is arguing, he says, right, have this mind in you which you have in Christ Jesus. He said, that's what Jesus is like. You be like it. Don't love yourselves more than other people. We love ourselves too much. All this rubbish, don't we, about people. Oh, I hate myself. What a load of rubbish. <coughs> no one hates himself. No one has ever hated themselves. No man hates his own flesh. That's what the Bible says. No, people go around saying, oh, I hate myself. They just think they're hard done by. They're saying that because they love themselves too much. Self-obsession says, oh, I hate myself. Our problem isn't that we love ourselves too little, we all love ourselves too much. And Paul is saying, love others before yourself. Jesus did it. Jesus is in you, so that means you can let Jesus through and you can do it as well. You've just got to decide that that's how it's going to be. You've just got to deny yourself, just like Jesus did in heaven. You've got to take that decision and say, right, I'm going to look to the interests of others before I look to my own. That is how we ought to be. The principle that Paul is saying is simply this. If you humble yourself and put yourself last, you'll be exalted. Because as a result of Jesus going down, 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 he ended up going up, 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 up. After humbling, comes exaltation. But in order to be exalted, you must humble yourself first. Go to Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 7. Do we want to be like Jesus or not? Here's a little parable. Now, Jesus told a parable, this is Luke 14, verse 7, to those who were invited, he's gone to a meal, when he marked how they chose the places of honour. You know, this is, Jesus here is dealing with the, it's me, <laughs> it's me, oh, I'm here. <laughs> this is the attitude that Jesus is referring to. He says, when you are invited by anyone to a marriage feast, do not sit down in a place of honour lest a more eminent man than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say, say to you, friend, go up higher, <coughs> then you will be honoured in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, the point is, Jesus here is talking about the way that Father will deal with us. And what happens is this. If we exalt ourselves, Father will slap us 
down into place. He will slap us down into place where we belong, in the dust. We are dust. But if we take that humble place, then God will exalt us. Do you see the point? If you put yourself forward, God will deal with you. But if we're willing to not put ourselves forward, then if God wants us forward, he'll put us there. He'll move us there. Can you see the point? What Jesus is talking about is that any problem, and we all have a problem with this, what he's basically saying is God is going to deal with our self-obsession. And that is the fundamental problem with every Christian, because every Christian is a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all obsessed with ourselves. Now, some people have it a lot worse than others, admitted. But self is the enemy. Self, 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 self. Remember a few studies ago, I said, you know, I, I know who my number one enemy is. And it ain't Satan. It's me. It's self. It's me. That is my enemy. That is what God wants to deal with. It's only as we're willing to humble ourselves that God will exalt us. Go to Matthew, Matthew 23. Matthew 23 and verse 11. <coughs> Jesus said, He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I.e., if you get proud, God will cut you off just below the knees. And he will. He's had to do it many times to me. But when you eventually start to get the message and realise what our place is, we are nothing before God, then, in that humbling of ourselves, then God can actually afford to start really doing things with us. Uh, many, many people, I mean, if God really started using them in a mighty way, God, it, it would be the end of them. It would be the end of them. There are people here, if God worked a miracle through you, it would be the end of you. I'd refuse to be your elder anymore. You'd be impossible. Can you see? Because this wretch, if something special about me would slip through. There is nothing special about us. Can you see? It's so vital that we become humbled people who God has really dealt with. Uh, go to 1 Peter, back into 1 Peter. 1 Peter and uh, chapter 5. Uh, we're going to start reading from the second half of um, verse 5. He says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. You know, this thing about, oh, I'm, I'm better than you, or, or, you know, oh, it's me. Here comes the answer, it's me. Paul says, no, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One of the little false teaches, you know, teachings that a lot of Christians put out, especially in the charismatic movement, they love saying this, they say, God is on your side. God is not on your side. God is not on my side. When Joshua met the man with the drawn sword just before he was going to lead the army against the city of Jericho, he meets the man with the drawn sword. Well, who was it? It was Jesus, because he took his shoes off and worshipped him. It was Jesus in his pre-existence. All right. Joshua met him. Now... Obviously, when a soldier meets another soldier, the first thing is friend or foe. You want to find out whose side they're on. And what Joshua said to this man, he said, are you for us or for our enemies? And Jesus said, no. What a helpful answer. Are you on my side or are you on their side, Lord? No. There's only one thing that matters. Are we on his side? So the point is, if I get cocky, if there's pride in my life, is God going to be on my side? Absolutely 100% not. He's going to oppose me. God will oppose his children. And if you want to declare World War III with him, he will quite happily go along with that. You know, he's not going to lose. You know. Um, we're going to get bombed off the face of the earth if we take him on, not him. God will oppose the proud. 
And that includes us as believers. Peter is writing this to a church. God is opposed to our pride and he will fight against it to humble us. Now one of the buzzwords today, isn't it, is spiritual authority. We all want to move in the authority of Jesus. You know, we all want to take authority over situations. And you can talk to believers and they're taking authority over this and they're taking authority over that and they're coming against this and they're coming against that. And all that presupposes spiritual authority. That is also a load of humbug. And it's for this reason. What is the nature of genuine spiritual authority? The nature of spiritual authority is humble servanthood. We will move in spiritual authority to the extent that we humble ourselves and serve. Do you see the point? To the extent we humble ourselves and serve, we will move in spiritual authority. You will have authority over Satan and the powers of darkness, over situations that you're in, if you're a bloke, over your family, over your wife, if your parents, over your children, you will have genuine spiritual authority to the degree that you are under God's authority. Do you see the point? Do you see the point? With some people, it really takes an attempt at casting demons out. I think a lot of Christians, they do need a demon laughing at them and say, I ain't going as long as you're telling me, sunshine. That's a very humbling experience. That, that does a lot of Christians good. You see what I mean? There is a direct relationship between genuine Christian uh, spiritual authority and the authority that you're humble, uh, under. If we humble ourselves and serve, then the Lord can have us move in genuine spiritual authority. But if we're exalting ourselves, you know, and sort of get all charismatic and look, look at me, lads, then, well, you know, what a mess is going to prevail. And what Paul is saying here, in, in a hundred different ways, all right, to the church of Philippi. He's saying, this is what Jesus is like, so this is what you must be like. And in the verses we've seen today, Paul reminds them, he says, look, have this mind that was in Christ Jesus. He says, have the same attitude that Jesus had. And he was saying, if Jesus, almighty God himself, was willing, because of his love for us, to leave all that behind, to become a mere man like us, and then to have lead a wretched life of rejection and suffering, and to end up dying on a criminal's cross. Paul is saying, if Jesus, if God himself can do that, he says, therefore, is it asking too much that we are humble towards each other? And of course, the answer is absolutely not. It's exactly what Jesus expects to, of us. Jesus is humble. He is self-renunciating. Jesus puts himself last and others first. And Paul's saying, right, that is how we ought to be. Now, further down from the verses we've gone up to tonight, Paul continues to press the point home in various practical ways. We, however, will end it there and pick up again next time.